to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul said and i brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to be looking in chapters 3 and 4, and we'd like to invite you to have your Bible handy and follow along as we're going to be looking at the Word of God together. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ in your area. The Lord's Church would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about uh, what they do in worship or uh, the plan of salvation, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. If you've got a Bible question or you'd like to know more, please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Uh, we have a wide variety of good Bible study material available there. We have audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, and any way we can help you spiritually, we'd love to do that, and it's all free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on DVD or any of our past lessons, you can download a copy from our website for free, or if you need a hard copy, we'd be glad to send that to you as well. We're just glad you've joined us today, and again, we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy as we look to the Word of God together today. What seems to be the major problem that was occurring in 1 Corinthians had to deal with some, which seems to be a large part of the congregation's spiritual immaturity. What do we mean by that? Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 when he notes that some are not acting spiritually mature. Instead, they're acting like spiritual babies. Notice the words again of 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 4. Paul says, And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? When one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? The problems the church was having in Corinth, and a lot of those relating to division over men, were because people were acting spiritually immature or spiritually like babies. Uh, probably parallel in many ways to 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 4 are the words of the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 5 verse 12 where the Hebrews writer says by this time you ought to be teachers yet you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God you've come to need milk not solid food what's the problem in Corinth and in the book of Hebrews there were people who should have been spiritually mature who were still on the milk of the Word. And, and that's really something, that's an oxymoron. That's something that shouldn't be happening. Imagine this illustration and see if this won't stand out in your mind from a physical standpoint. What would you think if you walked into, let's just say, a church building on Sunday morning and there was a full-grown man sitting on the front row drinking out of a baby's bottle? Well, you'd think, ooh, there's something wrong. With That's not right. Something's not right there. Well, what would you think if you went into a restaurant and the waiter plopped down in front of a baby a T-bone steak? Mm, I don't think he can chew on that. That's not, that's not right either. What's the point? One, 
needs the milk, but it ought to get to the point where it can eat solid food. One should have been off the milk and been eating solid food. And from a spiritual standpoint, Paul is saying, you Christians in Corinth, you've heard these things. You've known these things. You shouldn't be acting like babies anymore. Instead, you ought to be growing on the, on, the, on the food of the Word, on the pure uh, Word of God, not just the milk of it. Now, the problem was, of course, as we mentioned, they needed the milk, not the solid food when it should have been the other way. You know, anybody realize, you should start a baby out on milk. He can't, his body can't tolerate it. He doesn't have teeth to chew it. His digestive system is not ready for solid food. But as a baby grows properly, that milk is not going to satisfy it very long. It's going to need solid food to grow. That's what Paul is saying here. You've got to get off of just the milk and you've got to get on the Word of God to grow. Uh, Matthew 4 verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We've got to move on to deeper things and grow as a Christian sometimes. Then of course, when we think about how these Christians were acting like spiritual babies, you can imagine how a group of toddlers might act or a group of uh, one or two year olds might act if, if something went wrong or it wasn't pleasing to them. Let's say you had a, a group of kids, uh, toddlers, little kids playing in a room. Are there going to be any problems that arise? Well, sure. There's going to be whining. There's going to be fighting. There's going to be people that get their feelings hurt. There's going to be somebody mad at somebody else because they stole their toy or somebody did something they didn't like and it's just going to be chaos. Why? Because they're not mature enough to deal with all that yet. Friend, imagine when that's going on in the church. I got my feelings hurt. They didn't do what I wanted them to do. Uh, somebody said something that I think or somebody's mad. No, friend, we got to realize if we're going to be the church God wants it to be, we've got to grow and mature and develop as a Christian and not act like babies all the time. That's not going to help the church. Friend, one thing that we know about a baby for sure is that when they're at that stage of the milk, it's as though they've got that insatiable desire for it. And sometimes it just, that milk's not going to satisfy until they get something else. For a Christian to grow, he's got to have that same mindset. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. And as Peter said in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, there's no doubt as newborn babes we desire the pure milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. But you grow to a point where you're ready for something more and you need something else to be satisfied spiritually. A lot of times when you've got people acting like babies in the church, just like when you've got toddlers in a room, you're going to have arguments and fights. And friend, that's a sign that people spiritually have not matured as they ought to. Sometimes when you've got a lot of babies, you know what happens to them? A lot of times babies sleep, don't they? Sleep is a big part of a baby's uh, lifestyle. In fact, a large part of it. Friend, when people are spiritually immature, Sometimes they're asleep to the real things that need to be addressed, to where we need to be spiritually. Uh, sometimes uh, problems arise because of that, and, and we've got to deal with God's plan on how to address that. Now, as Paul deals with 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, he shows that the main problem is indeed spiritual immaturity, but he also is going to sh try to get across to these Christians that these people you're holding up, whether it be myself, Paul, whether it be Apollos, whether it be Cephas, we are just simply servants and ministers of God, and we don't want anybody to hold us up like that. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 5. Paul says this, and you know he's talking about himself, verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Who are these people you're holding up? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. What was Peter and Paul and Apollos' part in all this? Friend, they were just the mouthpiece spreading the message of God. That's not to say they didn't do a good job. That's not to say that we uh, shouldn't be thankful for what they did. Indeed, we are. But friend, they're just ministers. They're just servants. And they don't want anything more than that. Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, 
to his disciples who are in the context bickering and fighting over who's going to be the greatest. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, we want to sit on the right hand and on the left. And John and the, the, the brothers get their mother involved in this. And, and just a lot of bickering. And so Jesus says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10 verse 45. Stop your bickering. Stop your fighting. Stop acting like babies. And realize that these people who you're trying to hold up are just servants. And they don't want that. Luke 19 10. They realized. Our, our, part of our job is simply to seek and save the lost. We want to go out and do good. But we want God to get the credit and the honor. And friend, this is what. Paul drives home next. Not only do these gospel preachers not want you to exalt them like you're trying to do, but please realize this, Paul says, it's God who gives the increase. These men are not adding you to the kingdom. It's the message of God, it's the power of God, and it's the death of Jesus that does that. Listen to the words of 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 6. Paul says to drive this point home, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. When we talk about the increase, we're talking about fruit for the kingdom. We're talking about the Lord adding to the church daily. Acts 2 verse 47, souls' names being written in the book of life, people being saved. Who gives the increase? Paul says, I may have planted, uh, the, the, the seed is the word of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. The soil is the hearts of man, uh, of men. And so when Paul preached that gospel, which is the seed, and it fell on good and honest hearts, it was planted. Apollos then came along a, a little later maybe and watered that seed that was already planted, maybe gave more encouragement to obey the gospel. But when that spirit, seed uh, took root and sprung, sprung up, gave increase. Who gave the increase? Not Paul and not Apollos. God gives the increase. What's the point? Friend, God deserves all the credit and not men. What can we say on our best day, really? Luke 17, 10. And you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. I'm a servant of God. You're, those who obey the gospel are servants of God. But when somebody, when their sins are washed away, when they become a New Testament Christian, when they are added to the Lord's church, who should we be thankful for? God, who made salvation possible. God, who added them to the church. Jesus Christ, who died for their soul's salvation. And if all that's true, and the, the, when Paul says, he who planted is nothing and he who waters nothing, he's saying, stop putting the emphasis on men. Put it on God, who deserves all the credit and all the glory. As we think further into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're also going to realize that all Christians are actually fellow workers with God. Paul and Apollos and Cephas weren't in competition. Friend, Christians are not in competition. We're in cooperation. Together, as workers with God, we're all in this trying to save souls. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 9. Paul says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are are God's building. Again, there's not a competition. There's not a race to see who can do the most. We're all working in cooperation as fellow workers with God. God's the one, again, who deserves the honor and the glory. John 9, verse 4, Jesus said, We must work the works of Him who sent us while it is day. For night comes when no man works. Now's the time. Now's the opportunity. We need to realize our labor for the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. And friend, Paul is going to mention this very beautiful point next. While it is the case that someone may come along and plant the seed 
lay the foundation of the gospel, it is Jesus Christ still who is that foundation. I want you to see 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 with me. Look at what the Word of God says. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul will say, as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation, another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We move from a a planning and watering and, and growing illustration to now kind of a building illustration of this. Let's say you've got a house and you, somebody comes along and lays the foundation. Another person comes along and puts up the studs and the plumbing and electricity. Whose foundation have you laid? Well, the builder, it isn't his. The electrician, it isn't his. The, the carpenter, it isn't his. Uh, it's not the plumbers. Whose house is that? It's God. And that's the whole point. I may have laid, you know, come along and preach the gospel. Apollos may have come along a little later and try to put up the walls in some way, if you can use that illustration. But whose foundation and whose house is it? Every house is built by someone. He who builds all things is God. Hebrews 3 verse 4. The spiritual structure of the church and a Christian and salvation only belong to God. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, Hebrew, Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. And so let's realize that again, God and Christ deserve all the glory. And as Christians, we want to use our body. We want to use what God has given us to the glory and magnificence of God. I want you to hear the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 16. And listen to what Paul says about this. Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, talking to Christians, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. As Christians, let's use our life and our body to honor God. Uh, that's what God wants us to do in this life. We want to give Him the honor and the glory in every way. As I think about my life and as we think about being a Christian, let's realize we don't want to do anything that's going to defile our body or bring reproach on the Lord's church. You know, and some of the things we might mention, the immorality that existed in Corinth, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11, and the immorality that exists today. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, ungodliness, immorality, shacking up, living together before marriage. Friend, all of that ought not to be found in a Christian's life and body. Drugs and alcohol. If our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple of God to give Him honor and glory, friend, you don't want to use your body for things like that that are only going to do damage to you and to God. Uh, laziness, use of tobacco, things like that, all of those are going to hurt our influence and harm our body. And friend, we don't want, if our body is a, if Christians are the temple of God, He dwells in us and we ought not to defile that. And friend, let's not use the body, whether it be the physical body or the church of the Lord Jesus Christ for things that are going to cause harm to the kingdom of Christ. Then we notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse number 23, that ultimately all Christians do belong to God and they must give Him the glory and the honor in every way. And we do that by again realizing that we are just uh, stewards or servants of Almighty God. I want you to notice uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 as well. Notice these verses with me. Paul says... Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Paul's saying again, what are we? We're just servants. We're just a steward. We're just helpers in the kingdom of God. Yes, we need to be found faithful, but just as servants. We're not the, we're not the owner. We're not the one in charge. Look to us just as servants of God and ministers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, there's no doubt there's a need 
for the preaching of the gospel. How blessed are the feet of those who proclaim glad tidings of good things, Romans chapter 10 would say. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preaching of the message is necessary. And let's realize, Apollos, Cephas, Paul, they were just stewards and servants of God. That's what we are today. When we, the Bible says this in Romans 12, and I think about this often. Romans 12, about verses 14 through the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul will say, Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. Rather, we're to have humility and lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than ourselves. Friend, I'm, we've got to realize and we've got to understand that God has great servants in the kingdom who can do just as good, just as much as us, not downplaying anybody's service. But we're not, you know, the next best thing to whatever. We're not the next best thing to any Christian who's ever lived. We've got to realize while we're important to God, let's not elevate ourselves to a place of, hey, I am more important than. You need to listen to me because, or you need to know. God's Word is what we must listen to in every way. And friend, that's exactly what Paul is going to say next. We must listen to God and His Word and never go beyond what the Scriptures teach on that. I love this passage. I hope you'll see it for yourself in the Bible as well. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 4, such an important teaching here. Verse number 6. Paul says, Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of us may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Paul's saying, don't, don't put the emphasis on me. Don't put it on Apollos. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Instead, you need to look to the Word of God. That's where we find God's teaching. And so Paul will say, don't go beyond what is written. Friend, that's such a, a, a powerful teaching here that we must never go beyond the teaching of the Bible. Proverbs 30, verse 6, do not, listen to this, do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul said to the Galatians, I marvel, I'm amazed that you're turning away so soon from Him who called you into the grace of Christ, to the gospel of Christ, to another gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we've preached, let him be accursed. Friend, the staying with the Word of God, true to the gospel, not going to the right or the left. That's what Christians need to do. The Bible says in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, we must not add to nor take away from the Word of God. Friend, that's so important because when I stand before the throne of God and my life is ended, what's going to matter? What am I going to be judged by? What's the standard that I'll be held to? Jesus said this, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. On the judgment day, books are going to be opened. And friend, one of those books will be the word of God. The book of life will be there as well. We know that from the scripture. And our lives will be judged by looking into the mirror of God's Word, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And so that's why questions like these are important when it comes to religious matters. When Paul says, don't go beyond what's written, Christians ought to be asking questions like these in view of this verse. We ought to ask when we hear something of a religious nature, we ought to say to ourselves and to others, somebody says, this is what the Bible says you got to do. We ought to say, okay, where is that found at in the Bible? And if you can show me in the Bible, I'd be happy to do that. We ought to have a mindset. I'm not talking about cockiness, but I'm talking about humility and submission to the Word of God. Where's that found out, found out in the Bible? Christians ought to ask themselves regularly, does God approve of this action or does God condemn it in the Scriptures? And friend, when we look to the Word of God with attitudes like, if God doesn't want us to do that, we shouldn't. Uh, where's this located in the Bible? How do we uh, please God? Uh, study to show yourself approved unto God. Isn't that what Paul is saying in 2 Timothy 2.15? Study to show yourself approved unto God. What's that mean? You've heard that probably all your life. What's that mean? 
study so that you can know that what you are doing, the way you are saved, the way you are living is what God's wanted you to do. That's what 2 Timothy 2.15 is trying to express to Christians and to those in Corinth. And then we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we are taught very simply and very beautifully to be imitators of God. Now again, this is in contrast to people who are imitating men. Don't be imitators of Paul. Don't say, I'm going to be just like Paul. Or, I'm going to be just like Apollos. Or, I'm going to be just like Cephas. No. Say, I want to have the mind of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16. The Bible records this. Therefore, Paul says very simply, I urge you, imitate me. What's Paul saying here? Well, Paul is saying, I want you to follow Christ. I want you to follow my ways as I follow Christ. Paul is not saying, um, I want you to do exactly like I'm to be. No, Paul is saying, I'm a follower of Christ. I realize I'm a servant of Christ. We're not elevating ourselves. You follow our example in being imitators of God and imitators of Christ. And so as we think today about 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, the powerful message of spiritual maturity by looking to God, His Word, and not men. Friend, let's receive that encouragement in our own hearts and lives today. Let's make sure that what we're doing is based on the Bible. You know how to solve a lot of... Listen, I hope you'll listen real carefully to this. There's a lot of division, a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos in the religious world. A Christian says to himself, what can we do to stop that? Friend, here is the classic, powerful way to do that. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Don't go beyond what's written. If it's not written in the Bible, I'm not doing it. If God doesn't tell me to, I'm not going there. And if He does, I'm going to do my best to do it. Would that stop a lot of religious confusion today if we said, I'm going to do it if the Bible says so. If it doesn't, I'm not going to follow that. And so we encourage you today, if you're not a Christian, to obey the gospel. Saul of Tarsus was told by Ananias in Acts 22, 16, when he had not obeyed the gospel, to arise, be baptized, and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you today to obey the gospel, plan a salvation, become a Christian. If you'd like to study more about that, please contact us. And friend, we hope that today's encouragement will be for each one of us to look to God, to look to Christ, and to be imitators of what's good and right. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.